This channel is supported by AGR Model Railway Store of Leighton Buzzard. Please see the link in the description below. Hello guys, welcome back, hope you're all well. Today I'm going to have a look at some Class 37s by Backman, which I'm going to do a few modifications to for my friend Richard, who has the layout Garforth, which you might have seen in my Evening Star video. Now they are standard 37s from Backman, just with a sound decoder in each. They have a Lock Sound V4 with Legoman Biffo's, I believe, West Highland sound file. Now a big bugbear of mine is seeing tail lights left on when a loco is pulling a train. And uh, we can't be having that, it's, uh, it's not proper. So I am gonna take these, I'm gonna rip them apart. I'm gonna make the tail lights completely independent and map them so that you can turn them on and off as you please. And I'm gonna also separate the cab lights to make them independent also. I do that by leaving one end factory wired and the other end I'll put onto AUX2 of the decoder. The tail lights will go on AUX3 and 4 but because they are a Loxan V4 decoder in both of them, I'm gonna to have to use a breakout board for the auxiliary outputs because a V4, as standard, all three and four are only logic level outputs, so they can't cope with proper lighting. They don't have the power output. So I put a little extra board in there just to increase that enough to drive a set of LEDs, and um, that should do the job nicely. Now, while they are apart, I'm also going to take the time to fit an EM1 speaker in the pair of them, likely in the fuel tank, as well as split the twin iPhone speakers that are in the pair of them and use a single iPhone in each one to go along with the EM1 speaker. Now, another thing he's mentioned changing are the headlight arrangement on this. As it stands, the head code boxes are lit with warm white LEDs and the high intensity headlamp on the front is lit with a bright white LED. So he wants those reversed, so he wants bright white LEDs in the head code boxes, which to do that I'd have to change the LEDs, and he wants warm white in the high intensity main headlamp. Now that's easily solved by a little bit of Tamiya clear yellow on a cocktail stick, just dab it in there, once that dries that'll give you a yellow tinge, but obviously as I said the head code boxes are going to have to have a change of LED in there, so we'll see how we get on though, and we might get around to doing that, but as it stands, let's take them apart. I'm not gonna film everything because it'll be too long a video, but we'll do one loco and then we'll just do the other off camera and we'll come back at the end and sum up what we've done. Right then, well we've skipped ahead here and uh, I've got the two locos on the layout now and you might notice there is a very subtle but nice difference. What I've done is I've actually completed the work on the DRS loco here, as you can tell by the different lighting on the front. So as explained, Richard wants the lighting swapped around from this to this. So we've got bright white markers and we've got a warm white main headlamp. The uh, the initial idea was to use a bit of Tamiya clear yellow to make this headlamp yellow but in the end I sacked that idea off because I had to change these two LEDs on the marker panel anyway it's all on the same PCB so I managed to do it fairly simply so I just went ahead and swapped one of the marker light LEDs into the main headlamp but I did find that that was two orange sort of colours because if you notice Backman's what's supposed to be yellow is actually quite orange so I ended up swapping that back out again for a different warm white LED, which is the one that you can actually see in here. And it gives a much nicer warm white glow. And while I was doing that, I got a bit carried away and I also changed both cab light LEDs in this to the same LED I've used in the main headlamp. And you can see they give a nice glow in the cab and it really does look a lot more realistic than the standard item, which we've got still in these. The only thing is these ones, they're very dim, so just uh, take my word for it that they don't look right. If you've got anything back when uh, 66 or something like that with cab lights in, you'll know how awful the cab light colour is. So while it was apart, it was nice to change these. And you can also see that we've only got one cab light on because they are now directional. So the plan now, I've basically had a test run doing this one. This is all done, ready to go. It just needs a slight more bit of programming to make it work top and tailed in a consist with this one so that the nose end lights will turn off on the uh, intermediate cabs. 
So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go ahead and take this one apart because it's completely standard at the minute. And I'm just gonna show you roughly the process. I'll probably skip a couple little boring bits in between, but I'll just give you a general idea of what I'm gonna do. One more thing, just before we do rip this one apart, this has got the EM1 and iPhone speaker combo fitted. So let's just start this one up, which is a double iPhone first, and then the one after, and we'll just compare. Obviously the double iPhone is quite a powerful speaker setup, but it doesn't have any bass to it. So this probably will be louder than this one, but in my opinion, the one with the EM1 setup will sound nicer and it will have a lot more bass. So let's uh, get, first of all, get the one in the foreground started up. So this is the twin iPhone setup. So that was the British Royal Lars logo one, you can see. Now I'll start up the DRS version, which has got the EM1 set up. So I don't know how well you can pick that up in the video, but my thoughts of hearing it in person, so obviously the microphone might not pick it up as well, is that the double iPhone setup does sound good, but it lacks the bass that the 37s are notorious for. And the DRS one is slightly quieter, but when you actually have it on full RPM, you really get that sort of deep growl from the engine. You can even hear it on things like the compressor. You might've heard briefly that I quickly played that, uh, which was that. That's the compressor noise, but yeah, it's uh, it's a subtle change, but if you sort of know what you're listening for, when you hear one in person, you can quite appreciate how good it is. Obviously, it's not going to match an EM2, but the issue with an EM2 is you need to do a lot of machining to the chassis, or you need to basically cut the entire fuel tank off and make the fuel tank out of the EM2 speaker. And even then, it's still really too long. The only 37 I actually own is the Euro Phoenix one that came out last year and I fitted an EM2 to that and it was just so much work that I really never want to do another one. So I think my next 37 will be in a Curious Girl model because they come factory fitted. But yeah, so let's rip this apart. I'll stop blabbering on. Here we go. So here we go then on the workbench. We've got Richard's nice Batman 37 here. As I said, completely bog standard other than it's got a Locksound V4 with a twin iPhone speaker setup. Now, as mentioned, we're going to take those speakers out and I've got a single iPhone speaker here handily, so it saves splitting his in two. But this is the main one. It, this is an EM1 speaker and it's made by ESU. You can get these through Chino and Princess Risborough Railway. The code is 50344. So if you send them an email, they'll be able to supply you with those if needed. They're not too expensive, somewhere around 20 quid, something like that but they are well worth it, make a nice difference to a loco that's got quite a bassy nature like this. So they are the speakers, I'll just put them to one side. The EM1 speaker is gonna go in the fuel tanks. So if you look on the fuel tank here, it's a sort of decent size really, but you've just got this cut out in the middle. What I'll have to do is I'll have to actually cut that middle piece out so it's completely hollow. And I'll also drill some more holes in the bottom here just to let some sound out. On this side, we've got the tail light switches and cab light switches from factory, but I'm gonna remove all of those because we're gonna wire it into the loco so that you can do them on a function instead. And those holes will also let some of the sound out. In here, there is quite a large weight, which looks the same as this, funnily enough, that's out of the other one. <laughs> so that's just screwed in, that pops out, but to get to that, you've got to take the bottom half of the loco off. So first things first, let's do that. Let's get all the screws out and we'll crack on. 
So I've got my ESU cradle here, handily. That's also from Chiller and Princess Risborough Railway. So thank you to Roger, who runs their sort of uh, DCC sound side of it. And then you've got Jamie Goodman, who also does some of the files. I'm just gonna pop these bogey frames off. Try not to break them. Because that'll make accessing the screws a lot easier. There's one. You've got to be very careful when you do this because the little tabs are very easy to snap. I've done this a few times, so I sort of know where to get them. There you go. It's this little tab here. You can snap it very easily, but you've basically got to just pry that open with your screwdriver. So there's the bogey frames out. We've got a one snow plow there that happens to be broken. A little bit of glue will fix that. That wasn't me, that was like that. It's blue tacked on. <laughs> I'll put them out of the way. They're up there. That will then allow you easy access to all the screws because you need to get to these four screws here, which you can't normally see. So you've got one here, 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 and here. These aren't the screws to remove the body. These are the screws that hold the bottom chassis part to the top chassis block. So you need to take these four screws out in each corner, these two screws here diagonally, that will release the body, but then this piece of the chassis will be retained. So that's what these four screws are for. So we'll take those out now to take the body off. You can just unscrew it. So I've just made sure that these ones are undone, so they will pop out. So that body shell should now pull away. Just mind that detail, so I don't do what I just told you not to and rip it all. Just pop those pipes out of the way. That's that side. This side is just coming. And there we go, there's the chassis. We've got our screws there falling out, naturally. And uh, that is then separate from the body. So there's our body shell. We can put that to one side. We're not going to need that till later when we attack the lighting PCBs, which does become a bit of an interesting one because you've got to actually break the front of the 37 off to get them out. But for now, our point of interest is obviously the chassis itself. So to get to this, as I said before, you need to drop this chassis plate off. What I'm going to do before I do anything though is I'm going to remove this decoder and the speaker set up and just put it out of the way to one side just so that I don't damage it. Handily someone has blue tacked it in which makes it easier to get out. Probably uh, not the preferred method I'd use but there we go. So yeah, chuck the chassis upside down. Got those four screws that I mentioned that are in on each side of the bogey. Just whip those out. Now before you take this off the bottom, you need to just flip the chassis over and you'll see you've got these little PCBs here. That's where the contacts go for the lights. So we'll just get a little flat blade screwdriver. We'll just pop that under and try and pop them off. So I'll start with this one. Just wanna sort of pop them out. They've got little pins that they can locate on. There we go, there's one. And then same again on the other end. You gotta be a bit forceful with it, so just persevere. There we go, there's two. Don't be scared if you uh, do snap one of the pins off because you will just glue them back on after anyway. And then this obviously is loose on the bottom now, so just pull the wires out because they're sort of locked in by this little setup you've got here. And then that little PCB, you can just pull it out of the way. So just pull it up out of the way like that, and that shouldn't be a problem. So there we go. So now turn your chassis back over again. Obviously we've got the wheels out to give us a bit more room. You want to pull this sort of upwards and push over to one side so that you've got enough of a gap to get this past the bogey, you see there? You also want to do it here, and then while you're doing that, you want to push it back the other way. It's a bit hard to see because my hands are in the way, but I'll take my word for it. And then you just be able to pop it out 
there as well. There we go, there's both bogeys free. And that bottom part is now exposed. Uh, we're not going to need these tail light switches. So you will just take the wires off. So if I just pull these little bits off we've got here, they basically secure those wires in. It'll make your life easier actually to do this before you try and take the bottom piece off. So if you've got them loose, you should be able to pull this complete lot out. So the wires should come free if you're lucky. It's going to be a pain like that where I'm just going to have to loosen the PCB a touch. Put it upwards, give me a bit of wiggle room. There we go. Now they're popping out. See, and there we go. Now it's free. So there's your chassis block. That's the main sort of bulk of the 37. We're going to put that to one side for now because we're obviously going to concentrate on getting the speaker in here. So we'll come back to this later. So you see we've got our weight in there and connected to the weight is the PCB for those lighting switches. So we'll just unscrew these two screws here, which hold the weight in. Obviously you're not gonna need these screws again after you've done all this, so they can go in your spares box. Oh, they're quite tight. Never throw the screws away. You'll need them one day. Just. Uh, Get our screwdriver and push it up through the lighting switch, can't we? And uh, there you go, there's your weight coming out with your light switches, which we can discard. These locos are perfectly heavy enough without this, so don't worry that this isn't in there anymore. And uh, you can obviously put that to one side, save it, because you never know when you'll get a loco that you want some extra weight in. So it might come in handy. So the plan now is we're gonna cut these tabs off with a pair of snips. We're gonna basically then just cut this middle rectangle out, just clean it up a bit, make sure the edges are nice and straight. What you're then left with is this part in the center being hollow, and then your speaker will sit inside there. Now the speaker as supplied comes with tabs. You need to cut these off. So if you just get a pair of snips, I've got some zero on track cutters here. You just snip that off. Try uh, not to damage the speaker, obviously don't go too mad. You can just leave a tiny bit on it, it's still gonna fit. Just to get the main bulk off, there you go, that one's gone ping. <laughs> and that will then make the speaker small enough where it can fit in there, so you see that? Obviously, I'm now gonna snip off these little tabs, which are where them screws go in. Get rid of both of those. Try and go as close as you can to the bottom of the plastic. And uh, yeah, so that speaker's then gonna sit in. Once we've cut this little rectangle extruded piece out, the speaker's then gonna sit in there nicely, but you want it to sit flush with this so that one, you can fit the chassis block back on so that this isn't protruding, but also number two, so that the cones on the speaker, so these parts here are the cones, Obviously they move up and down, so you want a good couple of mil at least between those and the bottom of the model. So what I will do is I'll get a little piece of 1.5 mil plastic card I think I've got. I'll put it, I'll just cut a couple strips out. I'll glue them onto the end of the speaker, just as like a spacer. And then I will glue those to the bottom of the plastic. So I'll go away and do that. You can obviously imagine where I'm gonna cut on this. So I'm gonna go down here. Basically just all of the bit that's sticking out, I'm gonna cut out. And uh, I'm gonna do that now off camera and we'll come back. So I've cut the inside of the fuel tanks out now. You can see the nice slit there and I've just chopped the lugs off. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna drill some holes in just to let the sound out through this currently solid piece of plastic. So I'm gonna drill five holes in it and just to make it a bit neater, just draw a box on a bit of tape, put a cross through it, that's your middle hole and then just drill a hole in all of the corners. So that's that done, we've got five holes drilled, that'll let the sound out. I'll turn that over, we've got our speaker here, and obviously it's gonna go the other way up in reality, but it just shows that it just drops in nicely. You've got a little bit of gap either side, 
and uh, it's just lower than this sort of height here. So we're just gonna bring it up to match that height roughly. You don't wanna go above that because then it won't fit in the chassis. Um, but I'm basically gonna get some plastic art like I've mentioned before and just cut two small strips, glue them onto the edges here and then glue that face down into the fuel tanks. And then that speaker will also be protected by the bottom of this and that will uh, keep it from getting damaged. So there we go, there we've got our speaker attached in our chassis and now we're just gonna cut the plug off. You can see I've already done it here. Feed that back up through the chassis block and you wanna aim for the two small holes just down the side of the motor. You probably can't see them on the camera. You just have to take my word that they're there. <laughs> so you wanna aim for those. It's uh, probably gonna take you an attempt or two. If I try and get those in. See how we get on here. Got them there, so I'll just get a pair of tweezers and just pull them through. There we go, we've got them sticking out now. Then the uh, pain in the backside bit is uh, getting the little chassis piece over the bogies, which is a lot easier to get back in than it is to get out in the first place. There we go there. Just a bit of uh, jiggling about and they come back. And that is that. Obviously you just want to put your four screws back in, screw them up, and then that's done, that's all attached, good to go. Lovely, so we've got our chassis back together now. Our speaker is attached, you can see the wire running up through there. So I'll just pull that through. We're just gonna have enough room there to get those wires onto the speaker terminals, which, because this is an older Batman 37, it's one of the earlier 21 pins, I believe. The speaker points are here instead of on the side of the PCB, somewhere around here, similar to one of these pads. So you normally have two SPK pads, but yeah, for some reason they're in the middle instead. I don't know if this is an early version or a later version, but there's a couple of different types, but it's uh, not much difference really. You've just got to find the right spot to solder onto. But yeah, so that's done now. What we need to do is we'll glue back these little PCBs. You can see the uh, there for the lighting, where the little sprung contacts go on. We'll glue them back into that little chassis plate and then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to have a quick look at the wiring diagram and just make sure what I'm doing because we're going to have to separate some of these wires. So obviously the tail lamp wire is going to have to be separated on each end and we're also going to have to separate one of the cab lights which is going to be this end which is the number two end purely because the cab light at the number one end is obviously built into the PCB whereas this end has wires coming off it so it's a lot easier to splice into. So you'll see I've just drawn out the rough layout and uh, what we're trying to achieve here. Obviously we're separating all the lighting so we're going to separate the second cab light which is the one on the number two end. We're going to separate both tail lamps and they're all going to go to a different function. Now the issue with this is, as I mentioned at the start, these are fitted with a Locksound V4 decoder. As you can see here, here is the decoder in question. Now this is fine, but the issue is on a Locksound V4, the AUX3 and AUX4 outputs are actually only logic level outputs. So they aren't powerful enough to have LEDs running off them. So what you need to do is you need one of these little things, which is very, very small. You can just about see it. This is a logic level output booster. This basically, you've got the common positive coming in with the ground, and then you've got the function wires coming off of your decoder into here. And then you've got two wires coming out going to your tail lamps. So I've got the sort of setup of it written down here so you can see. This is the way around that I've drawn it. So we've got four contacts here and four here. The middle two on the left hand side you don't use. So the top right we have got the ground. I've got the 21 pin decoder drawn out here with the pins that we're going to be using. Obviously we've got number 11 crossed out because that's the index pin which is this bottom left hand corner here. So as I said the top right is going to be the ground. So we need to run a wire which I'll do in black from this top right terminal round to pin number 20 on the 21 pin socket on the locomotive which obviously you can see here this is that way up even so that's going to be you can see there it's the third pin down so the third pin down on here we're going to run a wire from there round to here 
on this little board that we've got. Aux 4, that's the logic side of it. So that Aux 4 the solder pad there is going to go round and it's going to go all the way round to the fourth pin down on the left hand side. Aux 3 below that is going to go to Aux 3 which is pin 13 here. So that is the second one up from the bottom on the right hand side. And then we've got the common positive on the bottom right, which is your blue wire generally. And that goes to pin number 16, which is your fifth one up. So that is going to be to power the tail lamps. And um, going from the tail lamps, on the actual PCB itself, the orange wire on each end is each end's tail lamp. So what you want to do is you want to cut the orange wire in here and you just want to make sure that it's not going to short out on anything and you want to desolder the orange wire off this solder pad here also. The only reason you desolder them is just because they're not long enough. So you're going to need to replace the wire with something long enough because I'm likely going to put the little board just down here to the side of the 21 pin socket just because it keeps it neat and it's out of the way. And then once we've got the wires going onto the socket itself, I'll leave a bit of a loop just in case one ever breaks off and you need to shorten it a little and solder it back on. You should leave a little loop there in a U shape and put a bit of black electrical tape over from one side to the other to just tape the chassis and then the tape the wires tight to the PCB. That will keep them safe and stop you snagging them. That's the best way I've found to do it. Obviously, it's a bit of a pain that you've got AUX4 on the other side because you're going to have all these wires come around here and then you're going to have one that also needs to carry on around the back and loop onto the back here. But you don't win them all, so <laughs> deal with it. <laughs> um, I've not mentioned the cab light because AUX3 and 4 we're going to reserve for the tail lamps. The cab light, I'm instead going to put on AUX2, which is pin number 14. That is the third pin up, as you can see. AUX1 we don't need to touch because the cab lights from factory on Backman locomotives are on AUX1 anyway. That is why I put the other cab light on AUX2 just so they're next to each other. Makes no difference in reality, just easier to remember when you're programming them in. So that's what we're going to go ahead and do. I'll just solder up some wires onto the little output booster board and then you can see the sort of arrangement that we're going for. So here is our logic level output booster wired in. You can see here we've got it glued just underneath the 21 pin decoder socket, which is the same way round as our little diagram here. We've got the four decoder side wires coming off and they are now wired onto the decoder socket PCB. They are very, very small little tabs. So make sure your soldering iron has got a fairly thin tip on it. Now I use DTC Concepts Atten soldering iron. The tip is fairly thin, but if you can get a thinner one, it will help because this is pushing it for the size that you're going to be wiring. Um, so you can see it anyway that I've got a little flat piece coming off there. I've just basically held that between my fingers and then just put a couple little twists just here, a couple mil up from that. That will just keep them all together and it will sort of strengthen that up a little bit. They're then again loose to go around the little loop and back. You can see I've put a little bit of black tape over the top. That just stops any sort of snagging so they don't pop up and I don't catch them on my fingers, something like that. So yeah, we've got the common positive at the bottom there, which is blue. That's the common color for that. Same with uh, AUX3 above that, brown. We've got AUX4 above that, which is purple. And then we have got the ground wire, which is black and in the top right. So they go round into their respective spots. So we've got the AUX3, the brown at the bottom there. We've also put in AUX2. There's a green cable. You can see it's loose on this end. I've put that in now while I was doing the soldering. If I zoom in, you can see it a bit better. And I've just also put that under this piece of tape just so that that's secured in. So you can see if I pull it, it's not gonna pull it off of that socket. So it's always worth doing that. Just try and make sure you don't cover this hole where the screw goes through because you'll be very confused when you try and put the body on as to what's going on. Trust me, I've done that before. <laughs> Obviously, it's no biggie. It just means you've got to take it off again and work out what on earth's going on. So it does uh, catch you out for a few seconds. Um, but anyway, above AUX2, you can see we've got the common positive in blue there. So we've got those three next to each other. Now, they are the harder ones to do because they are next to each other. You've got to be very careful that you don't get any, any solder crossing from one to the other you can very easily get that happening. 
and then you will cause shorts and potentially blow the decoder. So you want to double, triple check that before you go any further. We've got the ground wire there, third one down that you can see. And then we've got the AUX4 wire, as I said, looping around and going onto the fourth one down there for AUX4. So fairly straightforward. Hopefully that makes it a lot easier for people to work out. Now, just to add, obviously this is a Loxound V4. If you have a Loxound V5, this end of the decoder will be full of AUX pads that you can use. And basically, if you wire the lighting into the 21 pin socket on a standard V5, then you will still need to do this because AUX 3 and 4 on a standard Loxound V5 are still logic powered. But if you instead want to skip all that mess, you can then take your tail lamps and you can wire them straight to the solder pads on the end of the decoder because these are full power outputs on a V5. So AUX 3 and 4 will work completely normally. So that's just something to bear in mind depending on if you've got a V4 or V5. If you've got a V4, it makes no difference. So you have to fit this. If you've got a V5, you can cheat and just wire straight to the decoder. Obviously it means you can't just easily unplug the decoder and go, but it's not the end of the world realistically. How often do you do that? So anyway, we'll take the decoder back out of the way because we don't want to damage that. And now what we're going to do is wire the cab light in. So this is the number two end cab light PCB. If I just take off those two screws, try and do it one handed. So bear with me. Just unscrew those quickly. There's one. There's two. And you'll see on there, I might have to, oh, you can just about see it there. There's a positive sign on the left and there's a negative on the right. You just see it in the light. Obviously it's the negative that you wanna take off. So what you will do is you'll get this green wire. You wanna run that nicely through here. So it's out of the way, it's not gonna interfere with anything. And then you'll basically completely take this black wire off, take it off from the PCB point as well. Make sure there's nothing gonna short out there and you just replace it with the green wire and that is your cab light done. And once it, the wire is rooted nicely, hidden out of the way and not gonna interfere with anything else, you can leave that alone completely. All that's then left to do is the tail lamps. As I said earlier, they are the orange wire on each end. They are the opposite side because obviously the PCB is effectively turned round for the lighting on either side. So yeah, it's the orange wire. So at the front, it's the left-hand side and same on this side. Take those off, replace replace this wire from the solder pad and just basically run another wire all the way from one onto one of your logic board points. And then the other logic board point will go to the other end. And that will then be you done. You can plug your decoder in. You want to obviously give it to someone who's got a lock programmer so that they can program in the function outputs so that your lighting works correctly but you also want to make sure you read CV30 before you do anything because that will confirm if your wiring is, is correct and if you've got a short because you want to read CV30 and get the value of zero back again. That confirms that your wiring is all good. And here we are then, here's the chassis for the 37 all finished. We've got the tail lights now wired into the output booster board. So we've got the orange wire going up here. It's neatly tucked away and then it just comes onto each of these solder points. Same with this end. The cab light, we have taken the negative wire off and that is now wired directly to the decoder socket on the PCB. So obviously it's underneath the decoder so you can't really see it. But we have obviously got the little loop of wire in here which helps to stop us snagging and breaking anything off. So that's uh, definitely one to do rather than just make them the right length straight away. Because if you get into any problems later down the line, you're gonna be stuck. <laughs> now we've got the speakers in, obviously we've got the EM1 speaker underneath, which you can see just hiding away in here. There's the wires for it just coming up. They go for a little hole next to where the motor is. That is wired in series with an iPhone speaker, just a single one, otherwise you will overload the decoder. So basically one wire from the EM1 speaker comes up and goes on the speaker terminal on the PCB. The other speaker terminal goes to one side of the iPhone speaker. And then the other side of the iPhone speaker and EM1 are both connected straight together. And that creates your circuit. It won't be as loud as if you have them in parallel, but a V4 can't really cope. 
So don't wire them in parallel unless you've got a V5. V5s, you're still not supposed to, but you can get away with it. And I generally wire mine in parallel. But if you do it and it blows up, don't blame me. <laughs> Take my advice, do it in series and stay safe. But yeah, other than that, that's good. So we can make that back up to the body shell once I've finished changing the LEDs in the nose end. Now that's gonna be a pain because these nose ends do come off, but they are glued on from factory. So you've really got to be quite sort of aggressive to get them off and also try not to break the body shell. So it's quite a hard one to do. I've done the first loco, which is obviously that one there. So I know sort of what's involved now. So I'm just gonna pop these off and then I'll just show you me swapping over the LEDs. So here is the body with one of the nose ends removed. You can see that they do come away completely separately. They are designed to, other than Backman seem to like the idea of putting glue on them from factory. So you've got to be very careful, get them off that you don't snap anything. Now you can see these dowels here, they locate in the body shell. There are holes in the front. So you want to be very careful when you're trying to squeeze this off that you're not pulling it too far sideways and you really want to take it gently, otherwise these will snap. So this end is still on. I have loosened it off though, but just to sort of give you an idea of what to do with yours, you've got this um, bit of the body down here where it meets the nose end. You wanna just get that flexing just slightly and it will help break some of the glue away. So what I did, I was just I just kept sort of working it in and out like this until the glue sort of came away and that piece was loose. Same again with the opposite side. You don't wanna obviously put too much pressure on it that you break it, but you just wanna try and sort of get things moving. And then in, and then basically put your thumb inside it, ignore the state of my hands, I've just got a kitten. <laughs> uh, basically put your thumb inside it, hold it with thumb and finger, and then just wiggle it like that. Obviously it won't come off this easy, but you need to put a bit of force in and just be, be very careful. So yeah, just keep wiggling it until it'll come away. And then once it is, free you can obviously just uh use the dowels to place it back in they're quite a tight fit so you just chuck it back on and happy days that's that so once uh, they've been off i wouldn't recommend gluing them back on unless it really is broken with the dowels or you're having a lot of trouble with them falling off if they're not going to fall off on you then don't bother gluing them because if you don't need to get into it again it just makes your life more difficult but anyway what we're now left with is this little PCB, if I just zoom in, move the camera a bit, but if this little PCB here, and if I take this small little screw out, put that to one side, turn that over, there we have our LEDs. These are the two warm whites for the markers. Well, apparently they're warm white, they're more like urine color, good old Backman. And this is the bright white for the main headlamp. So obviously the bright white for the main headlamp, I'm gonna change out to a warm white. And these two marker light LEDs, I'm gonna change for bright white. So I'm basically gonna swap them over, but the uh, LEDs I'm gonna use are my own because they just give off a nicer light rather than these horrible things. The way I'm gonna do this is the same way I did the other ones. They're quite difficult to get off. So I basically held the LED with a pair of tweezers so I've got these really fine sort of modeling tweezers here. I basically held the LED and got my soldering iron and just went with the soldering iron on each side really quickly uh, until both solder pads were heated up enough that the LED would just pull off. That then saves you breaking anything. I mean, there's probably a better way of doing it, but that's the way that I found the easiest. So I'll just do that with all of them. And luckily there is a positive sign on e each side of the solder points. So you just need to get your new LEDs, just test what way is positive and negative, and then make sure that you put your LEDs in the right way round. Once that's done, put it back together and away you go. Now it's a bit difficult to show you how I do this, but bear with me. Basically I've got a big bit of blue tack, PCB is just tacked on to the top there. I've got my tweezers. I'm just gonna, there you go, there's one LED on. Off, sorry. As you can see, I just go either side. There's two. Just don't pull too hard on the on the tweezers because you can break the LED off. You break the top half off from it. 
and there's three. So that's all the LEDs off now. I'm just gonna put a little extra blob of solder on. Makes life a bit easier in a minute. Got plenty of room, so it doesn't matter if the LEDs stick out a touch more, but you don't wanna be messing about for too long trying to solder them on. So we've got all three LEDs off. You can see the board now is just empty. So what I've got is I happen to have pre-wired SMD LEDs here for when I'm fitting them into sort of coach bodies, things like that. Obviously we don't want them pre-wired, but so what I will do is I will hold the LED in my tweezers and then I'll just touch the wire on each side just so they fall away. And then I'll just place it onto the PCB and just quickly touch the soldering iron on and that should, fingers crossed, be good. Now also what's handy is on these ones, I'll buy the ones that have got a red and a black wire, and the red is obviously the positive, so you don't need to mess about the uh, multimeter working out which is which. So you can just go straight ahead, try and pick your LED up, and crack on. You just want to get it in your, in your sort of tweezers enough to hold it, but not too much where the tweezers will stop it going onto the board flat. So you see you've got the wires on here, just touch the solder iron on, on there and the wires will fall off. Now this is the warm white one, so that's going in the main headlamp position. Quick touch with the solder and iron. Fingers crossed that's good. So I've got a fluke multimeter set up here next to me, which looks like this. I've got that set on diode mode, as you can see there by the diode symbol. Quite easy to uh, recognize because it's usually for continuity it bells out stuff so the middle one is our positive and the left one is our negative and there we go that lights that led up so we know that one's good and as we know it's good leave it alone <laughs> do not try and touch it or jiggle it about a bit it's not going to affect it if the led isn't perfectly straight or if it sticks up very slightly there are lenses in the nose ends which will sort that out. You won't notice it. So if it works, don't touch it, as I've found out. <laughs> You'll end up just going through these like hot cakes, so just be aware. Um, but yeah, so we can discard, discard those two wires that we got rid of. And then next to me, I've also got a pile of bright white, which I'm gonna use for the markers. Same process again, just pick one out. They're all the same way round, polarity wise. So the uh, right hand side is the positive. So the right hand side on here, we want the red wire. And it's gonna be the same again, literally, as you just watched. We'll just get that in the tweezers. Once again, just give it a touch so the wires fall off the bottom. Like that. On the PCB it goes. And that's that on. Once again, we'll just check it now with our multimeter. Same way around again, and hopefully now both will light up. And there we go, we've got two out of three. Last one now. Just get rid of those old wires, I'm not out of the way, throw them in the bin. That in the tweezers. Hopefully you all can see this, because uh, I'm trying to do it without getting my arms in the way too much. But once again, get rid of those wires, place it onto the PCB. It's all going so well. Tiny bit of solder there and I think we'll be okay. I think this side's on. Right. So hopefully you just didn't get a shot of the back of my head. So we get our leads again. And voila! <laughs> there we go. So we've got all three lit up now. You can see we've got warm white at the bottom and we've got two bright white markers. If I put the black on the other side, you'll see we've got the two reds there. So that's perfect. That's going to do us nicely. So what we'll do now is we'll put this back together in the loco and uh, button it all up again. And we are finished. Right, so there is one last thing to do before you put the body back on. 
and that is to do with this cab light. Now, obviously we have taken the switches out of the tank. One of the switches was for the tail lamps, one was for the cab lights. So anyone that has not watched this video through to the end, they're gonna be rather confused right now because they're not gonna have a working cab light this end and they're not gonna be able to work out why. So serves them right. <laughs> Basically, the switches in the tank were connected to pin one, two, three, four, five, and six on here. Obviously we've took those out, so these pins were then empty. But this cab light still goes through all this circuitry. What you need to do is just connect up pin one and two, connect up pin three and four, and connect five and six. So just a wire across those two, those two, and these two. And then uh, your cab light will work. I don't think you need to do all three from memory, but it doesn't hurt to just do them just in case. And because you've got to put the body on to test it anyway, so just do all three. But yeah, so between one and two, between three and four, and between five and six, link them together. Then put the body back on, program it up, away we go, lots of tracks and noise. Well, that's the 37s finished and back together, all working. I've got a little bit more programming to do, but rather than run it on my layout and test it out, I'm gonna give them back to Richard. He's gonna have a little play of them, take some videos for us, and we'll see them on his layout so they'll get a proper run. And uh, fingers crossed, I'll get the mapping sorted. We'll have the lights all functioning by the time you see this video. I can't really run it on Harefield because it's in a right mess at the minute. I've basically ripped up the rear track and I'm doing a load of jigging about. You'll see that in a future video. But yeah, stay tuned for some running shots. Here we go. Hello, it's Richard from Garforth Model Railway here. Eric asked me if I could run through some of the modifications he has made to my 237, you can see here. Uh, I'm incredibly happy with how these have turned out. Um, in short, the sound has been upgraded with EM1s in both fuel tanks and Sing Life Owns under the fans. He's really improved the bass and treble balance uh, for both of them. Not for, not much louder, but they didn't need to be, really. But it's the lighting where these are absolutely fantastic now. As as he's fitted a AUX 3 and 4 extension board, um, because this is a V4 chip, they need an extra two non-logic function outputs. As you can see, the cab lights are now uh, directionally controlled, so they're independent. And if you hit F19, they'll switch off completely in the direction of travel. Uh, as you can see from the tails, um, if you hit F10, they'll turn the tails off. So if you're working a train in um, forward direction with the train behind, you can just hit F10 and that will turn the tails off. Uh, F20, if you switch F uh, zero off F20 will put it in stabling mode so you have tails on both ends um, which is a really nice feature if you have a depot scene or sidings although the function I'm most happy with is F21 this controls the rear loco in a consist so if you have them either top and tail or double header on sort of two light engines uh, you can have the rear engine just with the tail lights, no cabs, and no markers or headlights. And that is because these two are were quite prolific on the short set. Even though I'm not modeling uh, East Angular as much as I'd like to, it is something I want to recreate and it is a really nice feature to have. So when you're in a consist, you hit F21 for the rear loco and that will sort it out. Now, in terms of the lighting, uh, you can see the LEDs have actually been replaced. Certainly the cabs have now got less yellow LEDs, which does make a difference. And the marker lights, when these were modified or refurbished by DRS, the two marker lights were all replaced with cool white or LED clusters. Now, these appear very bright white and cool white, and that is why Eric has put two uh, cool whites in the marker position which as a result in the real 37.4s makes the 1980s um, high intensity light appear very 
warm or more yellow. So again, he's changed these because that is the opposite way around to how Backman actually provided these models. And it really does make the difference. Uh, so they've got new cab lighting and new uh, nose end lighting. The tail lights, I don't believe, have been replaced. But what Eric has done to make them look even better is drilled out both uh, marker light housings or tail light housings so they replicate the DRF modified uh, lights with the larger LED clusters and they really do make the difference but all in all absolutely fantastic work by Eric I'm incredibly happy with these and I'll now quickly run you through the sounds and get some running shots from Garforth Well guys, if you made it this far through the video, well done and a uh, round of applause because it has been a very, very long one at just under an hour. Uh, I must say thank you to Richard at Garforth for doing those little videos for me. Obviously with the current situation, I can't really be going around to his house filming things. Uh, we've got another week or two yet till that's sort of allowed. And uh, once that is over, we will be around there for some running sessions, I'm sure. So okay. go and check him out on Instagram, Garforth Model Railway. So that just leaves me to say the usual YouTube rubbish of please like the video, comment on it down below if you enjoyed it or found it helpful. And even if you've got a question, I'll be happy to help as long as I see your comment. And uh, please, as always, subscribe to the channel. We're almost at 3,000 subscribers now, which is incredible. And I've got a little something special to show you all in the next one. So stay tuned, go and follow Richard, go and follow AJ on the Railway Store as always on Instagram and Facebook, and I will see you soon. Take care.